it's, it's easy when we have a week like this week and the news reports have been such for us to, to see, right? And just to, we see things like what's happened in Paris and, and to know that this world is fractured and broken. Like it's easy to spot that, right? That that's, that's messed up. Um, but sometimes what's a little bit harder is to see where we are inside of us, where we're fractured and broken, right? It's easy to, out there, okay, I got it, but like in here, where am I fractured and broken? Because all of creation has been fractured and broken. Like there's no one, like there's no one righteous, no, not one. There's no one perfect outside of Christ. And so in the same way, like the news points us to the fact that this creation's fractured and broken in the same way the law and specifically the Ten Commandments point to show us that we are fractured and broken. And so we've been in for the last 10, today's the 10th week, we've been looking at the Ten Commandments. And one of the things we've had to do is kind of shape our understanding of what God is doing in the Ten Commandments. That some would say, well, he's just laying out for his creation, for society, like what it looks like to be productive and good and moral, you know, functioning society. And so we don't do those things. And what I want us to see even in today is that really that's not the primary um, reason why we have the Ten Commandments. But the primary reason for the Ten Commandments isn't, it's not just, and again, the word primary, and it's not just to inform us on what we are to do, but it's also to show us where we fall short. And like we need to be honest about where we fall short. Like today's commandment is do not covet. And it's the one that in in any other, you know, list of moralities that you're going to miss do not covet because coveting feels so benign, right? Like it doesn't feel anything wrong with me just looking and desiring and longing for me to have a yard that looks like my neighbor's yard that's all weed free and he gets out there with his little scissors and trims along the sidewalk and you know it, like does that is that wrong for me to look at that and just be like oh i wish that my yard looked like his yard right like like is it wrong for me to covet my neighbor's weed free perfectly edged lawn and scripture here would say like yes oh but that doesn't feel uh, and like, listen, here's what we need is we, we need to, uh, to feel the full weight. We need to feel the full weight of our sin for two reasons. One is because it makes us long for a savior. Like if you could do it, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to come. But you couldn't. We can't. And so Jesus has come and he's done it for us. He's kept the law perfectly for us. And when we understand that, second, secondly, it shapes us, it shapes into worship and into love. That there's an event that is in uh, the gospel accounts where Jesus encounters a woman who's been caught in an adulterous affair. And um, Jesus, you know, Jesus sweeps in and saves this woman's life. He, it's, it's where he says, you know, the one without sin, let him cast the first stone and all of the women's accusers drop their stones because Jesus is the only one there that has the power and has the right to cast a stone, and yet he doesn't. I mean, if you don't miss that in the story, like Jesus is the one without sin that could have cast a stone, and yet Jesus didn't. And what Jesus says to the woman, he offers her forgiveness and says, go and sin no more. And then there's another story that seems disconnected, but Scholars believe that it's the same woman. I think there's enough biblical evidence to say that it is. That Jesus is reclining at a table with a bunch of religious men and, and sitting there who feel like full of themselves and their self-righteousness. They're reclining at the table and eating, and this woman barges in to the, to the room, into the home, and falls at Jesus' feet, begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and dry Jesus' wet feet with her hair, and, and this is an act of worship, and Jesus receives this as an act of worship. And the people in the room, they, they, they're like, if you only knew what manner of woman this was, then you would kick her out. You'd be done with her. Like, you wouldn't let her even touch you. And Jesus says to them, he says, like, leave this, let this woman be. For, he's like, this is what you're missing. The one who's been forgiven of much loves much. 
And if we're quick with the little lawyer that's inside of us to always rationalize and justify our sin or to mean like, well, this really doesn't mean this or this really isn't that bad, it greatly affects our ability to love Jesus as a Savior who has saved us from our sins. That it's only when we are free and honest before the Lord about our sins and we, and we allow ourselves to feel like this is, the, this, is the, this is the commandment for me that has wrecked me this week, as I've studied it and as I thought about it, like I haven't wanted to preach it. At one point, I was like, I don't know that I'm qualified to preach it because I, I find myself coveting often my own personal life as well as, as, as a pastor. Like, how many people does our church have? And how many people are we connecting? And what are we doing? And like, all of these outward measures as to whether or not God's favor is upon me and upon my ministry. And like, I just look to other churches and other ministries and other pastors and I, I covet. I covet their gifts. I covet their abilities. I covet their people. I covet, covet their, like for whatever reason, I generally don't covet the, their buildings, but their, their budget, right? And their, and their people. And we just got to be honest that, that, that this, this commandment, it, it points us that we're sinners. And it's only when we're honest with that that we can be a savior. And we saw it last week that one of Satan's key uh, weapons that he uses is deception. That Satan longs to deceive us. And we've got to allow the word to illuminate, to, to shine a light, to show us. And what, what, the, what the word illuminates is it illuminates both us as sinners and it illuminates Jesus as a savior and it illuminates our way to Jesus. And so, so we need this, right? So this might hurt a little, but we need this. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus, the 20th chapter. <clears throat> That's where we find the Ten Commandments. And here's what the Word of God says. Exodus 20 and verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you loved us enough to give us your, your word, your law that points us to your son, the perfect law giver, the perfect law keeper, and give us hearts, like illuminate, show us where we fall short, that as we're going to see in this text, that, that coveting leads us to dissatisfaction, it leads us into a whole, whole host of other sins, and it keeps us from being whole and being pure before you. So, Father, in this time, just reveal your word to us. Show us. Reveal our own hearts to us. May we be quick. May we be quick to repent, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's first off, let's define coveting. Just so we're clear on what we mean by it. It's this. Coveting is ungodly, discontented desire. So the key word there, well, object is desire. That's what we're going to talk about. It's something that happens not outwardly, even though most of the other uh, um, commandments, like six through nine, have been outwardly. This one's dealing inwardly with what's happening on the inside of us. So it's an inward, ungodly, discontented desire. It is the, and maybe you want to write this down, it's the attitude of the heart when we believe what we desire is better than Christ and what he has given. So there's two actions of the heart occurring when we covet. The first action is we desire for something other than God that's increased. So what, what God, who you are, first of all, and what you've given isn't enough, but I, I have a desire for something else outside of that. But second, there's a second action happening simultaneously that as this desire is increased, our satisfaction and our contentment for God and in God and in God's providential care and God's blessing for us, it is diminished. So that's coveting. Our desires are increased for something outside of God, but yet at simultaneously our, our contentment and our satisfaction with God is diminished in that. So coveting is desiring something so much that you lose your contentment in God. 
or it's losing your contentment in God so that you start to seek satisfaction in something else. So coveting takes the form of ungodly passions or inordinate desires, envy, greed, obsession, jealousy, or lust. They're all under the broad term of coveting. And this is like, this is tough for us. As Americans, in our culture and in our society, this is very difficult because we are bombarded constantly with enticements to covet. There's a multi-billion dollar industry with a whole science behind it of people that study ways to get you to covet because in your coveting, you're going to go out and purchase something. It's called advertisement. You're watching TV and every six to eight minutes, there's something being shown to you for, a, for another four minutes or two to four minutes telling you what you're missing out on or what you need or what you could have or what you should have. TV commercials, billboards, infomercials, right? Even, even in television shows, like last night, I was uh, laying in bed, trying to go to sleep, and sometimes on Sunday nights, in order to kind of tune things out, like, like we'll put on something that just like doesn't elicit a lot of thought, so definitely not Fox News. Um, Lou Ann's been watching the uh, Hallmark Channel, but that's causing a little friction, right, in the family. So it's like sports, Hallmark, which one's it going to be? And so sometimes we have to compromise, and we watch HGTV. So that's what it was last night. Because we had it on HGTV, and they're showing this, this show called House Hunters. So it's a couple that go, and they show them two or three different homes, and they get to choose these homes. But it's like they go into, like, almost perfect homes, and then they just nitpick the home apart. Well, I don't know that I can stay here because, you know, it's only uh, 3,500 square feet, and really what I'm needing is, like, more like 3,800 square feet. And I'm like, you know, are you kidding me? 3,800 square feet? It's like you and two kids. And they're like, well, you got these kids. And I'm like, these kids? You got two kids. Are you? And so last night, like I'm watching all of these homes and all of a sudden, like I start thinking about my own home and thinking like, man, this place is a, kind of a dump, really. Like if you think about it <laughs> in comparison and like, like constantly, right? It's, it's all around us. Like the apostle Paul and the writers of the New Testament, like they, they, they just looked at their neighbors. Like what's my neighbor have? And as long as your neighbor who you know, who you see, who's around you, as long as he doesn't have a new truck or a new boat or a new RV or something like that, like you're generally pretty good. But for us, it's like everywhere, all the time. You can't watch anything. You can't go anywhere with your, where you're not being tempted and enticed to covet. And yet we know that, again, the reason why we can't be content with what we have is because we're flawed and we're broken. The letter of the law, it says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. You're like, you know, I've never looked at my neighbor's ox and like wish that I had one. So I think I'm off the hook. Well, let's like get beyond the letter of the law and let's dive down into the spirit of the law. What he's saying, this isn't an exhaustive list. Do not covet, do not desire, do not be jealous of anything that is your neighbor's. Well, who's my neighbor? There's a question they ask. It's everyone around you is your neighbor. Not just the person that you live geographically next to, but everyone you know, everyone's around you is considered to be your neighbor. So don't look at your neighbor's house or their household, not your neighbor's possessions, not your neighbor's car, truck, van, SUV, not their boat, not their RV, not their, home, not their house, not their yard, not their landscaping, not their wife, not their kids. Don't look at those things and be discontented with your things and desire them to where it, it upsets your happiness, it upsets your contentment, it upsets your like that, 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 that feeling of that somehow I've been slighted, that feeling of like, well, they've got and I don't have. Like, don't let that enter into your heart. I think for men and for, for, for ladies, I think these, these hit us at two different Two different ways and two different spheres. 
Luann and I, we, we talked a lot this week of, kind of about this and what coveting looks like for, for, for men versus what it looks like for ladies. And for men, it, and I know this is a generalization, but for men, most of it's about possessions. Right, the time that I'm tempted the most to covet is when, when you, one of you roll up in like a, a new vehicle, right? Or not even, a, it doesn't have to be brand new, just a new to you, especially something that's kind of a little loud, you know, a little grumbly in the motor. The old Suzuki just, well, the Suzuki just don't have that, right? Some of you, you know, and I'm just like, man, how nice would that be? For men, it's possessions or it's profession. Possibly it's family situation. But for ladies, I think it's less physical and possessions and more other stuff. Like, ladies don't covet, don't covet another wife's husband. And not like men are tempted to covet a wife where it's generally in lust physically, but in, oh, I wish my husband was like her husband. He's handsome and witty and and godly and spiritual and courteous and kind, and I'm married to this Neanderthal, (laughs) right? Like, that's a slippery slope because you don't really know what it's like to be married to her Neanderthal, right? With ladies, it's, it's, it's different. Don't covet another woman's body. Oh, she's so, like, again, this is what Luann says. Like, she's so skinny, right? She, like, I, I, eat a, I eat a grape and gain five pounds. She eats a whole bag of Oreos and nothing. Like, how, how is that? How can that be? Don't covet her organizational skills. Oh, she's such a great mom. Again, this is where it's commercials probably don't affect you, but social media does. The mom that takes a picture of her, you know, little workspace and everything's got all of this little stuff. Or, hey, this is what we're doing today, and it's some, you know, daily job chart that's up there. And don't covet those things, not, not her schedule, not her abilities, none of those. That for men, coveting leads us to be discontent in what we have, oftentimes. But for ladies, it looks different. That your discontentment leads you to be discontent in who you are. It makes you feel less valuable about yourself. And again, this is a ploy of the enemy. That ultimately our contentment comes not in what we have, or not in who we are, just in who we are but we're content with because of what God has given us. And for ladies, you're content in who Christ declares you to be. That your value isn't found in who you married or who you are or in your size or in your organizational skills or in your profession. But your value is found in the fact that Christ has purchased you. He has ransomed you. He has saved you. You are his. You're his child. So why are we called not to covet? The other ones make sense. Don't steal. That makes sense. That's yours. I can't take it. Don't lie. That makes sense. People get hurt by lies. But what does it hurt with a little bit of secret secret inward coveting? Well, as I said, with all of them, it's first rooted in God's character and God's nature. That God is sufficient. That in God, he has no need. Did you, have you ever thought of that? There's nothing that God ever needs. Nothing. He's never without. There's nothing that you can add to him. There's nothing that you can give to him that he is completely whole in the Trinity. Complete wholeness there. Complete sufficiency in him. Like he didn't create you because he needed to be worshiped. There was a trinity that was constantly worshiping one another. He didn't create you because he longed for community. There was perfect community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
that there's never been anything that God has ever needed. Paul says this in Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself, he, look, he gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, that God is the the fountain. He's the source. He's the giver because he is the one who's completely whole in and of himself. He needs nothing, but he gives to those. He gives to us. That is God who satisfies. It is God who is trustworthy in this. That Jesus says this in John 6.35, He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. It's a strong statement that he's making. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. You'll never have a desire that isn't met when you desire me, when your desires are found in me, culminate in me. In other words, what it means to believe, like this is important, what it means to believe in Jesus is to experience him as the satisfaction of my soul's thirst and my heart's hunger. So over and over again, Scripture talks about a foundational principle of Scripture, of of our relationship with God. The foundation is found upon faith. The just shall live by faith. So what does it mean to to believe in Jesus? Well, it it means more than we just believe in the existence of Jesus. We talk about that often because we confuse that in our culture. We think believing in Jesus is just affirming in some intellectual way or even some verbal way that we just affirm that, well, no, I believe in God. I believe that God exists. We may even say something like, I believe, in, I believe in Jesus, but it's not just believing in the existence of Jesus because James tells us that even the demons believe. Even the demons believe. So that's not a big deal because certainly the demons aren't going to be in heaven. They don't receive eternal life. The demons aren't in a, in a uh, whole relationship with God. So it's more than, that, than just that. It's, it's more than just believing in orthodox theology. It's more than just believing and affirming what the Bible kind of teaches about God or teaches about Jesus. Matthew 7 says there'll be many on that day that will say to Jesus, but Lord, Lord. So they've got good theology. It's more than just religious practice. We've done this. We've, we've, we've spoken tongues. We've done all of these great and miraculous things. It's more than just being all jacked up about social justice. That believing in Jesus is even deeper than what it means that in that. Believing in Jesus means that we're trusting to the degree that there is a radical reorientation of our very fiber and makeup of our lives. That we're reorienting everything because we, because we are mentally affirming and acknowledging Jesus. Because we do believe in orthodox theology, but it's not just enough to affirm it, but it calls for a radical reorientation of our lives around it around the person, around the work of Jesus. It doesn't just affect our theology, but it affects every facet of our lives. And the just living by faith, well, faith is the experience of contentment in Jesus. That's what faith is. It means that we believe in Jesus and we believe that, that he satisfies our every longing. That I think sometimes we erroneously divide up our lives into two different spheres. Sphere number one is the theological and the spiritual, right? That we really don't know a lot about it. It affects our Sunday mornings. It has to do with our relationship with God. It has to do with a bunch of words that end in shun, justification, right? Sanctification, glorification, a bunch of other words, like I don't even know what they mean, but I think that's what, you know, that sphere includes and encompasses all of those sorts of things. And then there's another sphere that they too rarely touch, and it's the sphere of real life. It's the sphere of when the car won't start. It's the sphere of, well, no, I got this diagnosis, And the truth is, it's these two spheres that it's an erroneous understanding of what God has come to do, who Jesus is. 
But the Apostle Paul says, I think it's in the book of Colossians, he says, when Jesus, who is my life, appears. Then what does it mean to be a believer in Christ? It's when those two spheres intersect and stay intersected, when Jesus isn't just something you believe spiritually, but he affects everything about your life. The Apostle Paul says he's given to us everything. No, I'm sorry, this is in 1 Peter. Peter writes, he's given us to everything when it comes to life and to godliness. Everything we need is found in him. He fills our every longing. He fills our every need. He fills every one of our desires. Why is coveting wrong? Well, first, because it's antithetical to the nature and character of God. Then in coveting, you're said that God hasn't given me enough. That what I long for What I long for is better than what Christ has granted to me and who Christ is to me. But second, coveting is idolatry. That's what Paul says in Ephesians. Remember, we've been looking also, while we're looking at, while we've been looking at um, Exodus and the Ten Commandments, what I've been saying each week is that the Apostle Paul picks up the same list and uses it in, in Ephesians to show us what it means to to be a follower of Christ. How do we walk in uh, this new life that Christ has given us? And so each week we're saying, he's saying, you know, put off falsehood. Each week we've been, we've been looking at this, and the same is true for what he says about coveting. That coveting shows up in this list. It's actually in Ephesians 5, and in verse 5, Paul says this, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral... I want you to pay attention to this list. Again, the words showing us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. For everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. I mean, that's, that's quite the list. The sexually immoral, okay, the... The guy that's just out there after, we, we get sexual immorality, we get impurity, but then he adds coveting in that list. And that why? Why does he add it? Because look, he says that is an idolater. That the person who is covetous is also an idolater. And he, looks, he says they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Coveting feels benign. Coveting will land you in hell. The coveting will give evidence. Now, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Like, I, okay, that's, okay, let me clarify this. Coveting will give evidence to the fact that you've yet to find your satisfaction in Jesus. That you're yet to be content in Jesus which would give evidence to the fact that you don't know Jesus. You don't have Jesus. You haven't eaten of the bread of life. You've never tasted it and allowed your soul to be satisfied. You never drank of Jesus and allowed him to quench your thirst. Let no one deceive you, he says, verse 6, with, with empty words, for because of these things, look, the wrath, because of what things? He's coveting. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He says the same thing in Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. That's Colossians 3, 5, and 6. That The first commandment and the tenth commandment and the ten commandments are basically saying the same thing. The first commandment is, you'll have no other gods before me. You'll have no other gods beside me. The tenth commandment, do not covet your neighbor's stuff and possession. Do not covet anything that isn't yours. And he's saying when we do, when we do covet that, because it has to do with desire and inordinate desire, taking taking good things and making them into ultimate things, when he's saying when you do that, that you're, doing, you're breaking the first commandment as well. That's idolatry. Now you see why the Apostle Paul, see this is the, this is the commandment that, that just wrecked the Apostle Paul. Like the Apostle Paul, when he was a good Jew, he thought he was doing pretty good as a good Jew. 
I mean, he was one of those guys that can be like, you know what, the Ten Commandments, man, I got them. And then he realized the one that he couldn't stop was coveting. The one that pointed to the fact that he was broken and flawed inwardly was coveting. He's like, I tried, this is in Romans, the seventh chapter, I tried to stop it. But when the law came, when the, when the commandment came, do not covet, he said, covetousness upon covetousness rose up inside me. And it causes Paul to, to cry out in the end of Romans 7. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It pointed him to a savior. Because we can't control it. Because we're broken on the inside. And yet, that is so true that we can't control it. But yet, that's why he's given the spirit to us. That's why he declares you can't do it on your own. That's why he saved you and redeemed you and is changing you and is filling you so that you can kill sin. That the Christian never says, hey, this is just the way that I am. It's no big deal that when he illuminates our sin, we don't go over and flip the light off. Right? We'll give that illustration a few weeks ago. Like when you flip the light on, you see a mess that has been made. You know, your tendency sometimes is to go over and flip the light off and just pretend that it doesn't exist. And when the Word of God illuminates junk in our hearts and junk in our lives, we don't go over and flip the light off. We, through the power of the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body so that we can live. So let me give for you. Why, why should we do this? Why should we fight sin other than the fact that it's just sin? Let me give, give to you four truths about coveting that maybe you've not thought of. So here's four truths about coveting as we just, as we just try to undo the deception about coveting because, again, it feels so benign. It feels so easy to do. So let's just really talk about coveting in a way that really undoes the work of the enemy here. Number one is coveting never brings satisfaction. Ecclesiastes 5.11 the, this is written by the, the richest man to ever live and also the wisest man to ever live. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with gain. This also is vanity. You're never satisfied. There's never enough. Like there's always somebody out there who has more like, I know right now you feel like, hey, if I could land that job that pays me X numbers of dollars per year, I would be satisfied with that. But guess what? When you reach that place and you get acclimated to life living within that annual income, guess what you're going to want if coveting is true in your heart? The next place, and then the next place, and then the next place. Like we said, when it comes to coveting, it's not a matter of your job. It's not a matter of your salary. It's ultimately a matter of your, of your heart. Jesus says this in Luke 12, 15, Beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That's not what your life's about. It's not about what you can gain and what you have and what you can acquire. The coveting is a sinful condition of the heart. It's what it is. Like certainly, like the word of God is sufficient to teach us that, but like there are those of us here who know or we see them on the news all the time about we see miserable rich people, don't we? Because riches and possessions don't satisfy. Well, I know that like, well, you know, they, cause they might help, you know, like that's the way we feel, you know. I had a new truck, man. It, might, it, it would last for at least a year of me feeling pretty good. Guess what? The newness will wear off. Because the problems, again, the problems with our heart. We see this, like it, it, we see it in our kids oftentimes, don't we? Like we see a coveting just heart with, oh, I need, I need, I gotta have, I gotta have, and then they get and... You know, like, like, like if, you, if, you, if you haven't seen this, if you haven't experienced this, then like here's what, here's what you should do is talk to D. Smith and go volunteer in the children's ministry because even your and my good Christian kids, we, we do this. Like go in there and all the kids will be playing and then one little kid will go over and get this other toy and then the other kid goes and takes it away from them and not even because they want the toy. 
Right? You ever seen that kid? Oh, they're playing with the red truck, and the kid throws the fit for the red truck. And so finally he gets the red truck, and then he takes the red truck, and he just sits it down. Because right? the problem's in our hearts. That's what the problem is. Number two, so number one was that coveting never satisfies, never brings satisfaction. Number two, coveting chokes off spiritual life. Jesus tells, in a, gives this parable called the parable of the sower. He talks about a sower who goes out and sows seed, onto, and he talks about these different types of soil. So Jesus is talking about the one who sows the word, the work of the word, the seed, the, the, the message of the kingdom of, the, of God. That's the seed that's being sown. And then he talks about the soils, and he says they're conditions of people's hearts. And one of the types of soils that he talks about is the, the soil that, that had thorns in it. That some of the seed, they, they landed upon the soil where there were thorns. And it says that the thorns choked out the work of the seed, the work of the word. And Jesus says that the, that the thorny ground is the heart that cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things that they had entered in and it choked the word out and it proved it to be unfruitful. That the thorny heart misses that Jesus is the all-satisfying Savior and runs to the things of the world. So it chokes off our spiritual life. Number three, it, Coveting feeds and it fuels other sins, especially sins six through nine. So commandment number six, do not murder. And then Jesus teaches us that anger and bitterness in your heart is the same as murder. And what James says in James 4, 1, he says this, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Coveting. It's feeding, oh, eventually, maybe even possibly murder in our lives. Commandment number seven is adultery, and it's fueled by oftentimes lust. Maybe a lust for something else, or at least a dissatisfaction for what we have. Or what God's given us, a co- we, we covet approval. We covet to be told that we're handsome or beautiful or virile. Someone comes along and, and, and gives us that, and we fall into an adulterous affair with them. What's it being fed by? Again, it's being fed by coveting. It's being fueled by that. Stealing is fed by coveting. You see something, so you want it, you take it. Lying is fed by coveting something that you, you want to keep, something that you want to protect, and so you lie to get it. The coveting feeds and it fuels all sorts of other sins in our lives. Number four, in the end, coveting destroys the soul. It's the fourth one, that in the end, that is coveting that will destroy the soul. That in both, as we saw in Ephesians and Colossians, the wrath of God is coming because of this sin. Because of sin and sins like coveting. It's an inability to be satisfied with Jesus. It gives evidence, as I said, to the truth that maybe you're not really saved. Maybe you've really not been regenerate. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. Man, that's a strong statement. Do not love the world or the things in the world. That's so difficult for us because we got it so good. Because this world is so comfortable. This world feels so good. New things feel great. New things bring pleasure and bring happiness. And it could be, just could be idolatry as well in our lives. The love of the Father. He says this, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life that is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Don't love the world. Don't long for the world. 
Don't have an inordinate desire for the things of this world because here's the truth, they're going away. That ultimately, coveting will never leave you satisfied in the times when you need it the most. And ultimately, that time will be when you stand before Jesus. That all your possessions, all of your neighbor's possessions, and all of your wants, and all your unfulfilled longings will mean nothing when you stand before Christ. That Paul speaks to Timothy about this in 1 Timothy. And we'll finish up our time there. So if you have your Bible still out or your Bible app, refresh that. And I really want you to see this text. We've looked at it once before. But I want us to look at it again. Because it's just something we don't talk a ton about is contentment. Being satisfied in Jesus. And maybe we need to talk about it more. Well, as, as Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, this is what he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. There's great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those, here he's talking about a group, but those who desire to be rich. That's their desire. So that's, that, again, that's the problem is this inordinate desire. Well, I don't, I don't want to be rich. I just want to have a little bit more than what I have. Like that's, that's the warning signs right there. Can you be content with what you have? Can you be content with where you are? But those who desire to be rich, they fall into a temptation, into a snare. Do you understand a snare? It's a trap. It catches you. It kills you. That's what a snare is. But those who desire to be rich, they fall into the temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Into ruin and destruction. Here he's not just talking about, oh, if you covet and then you get caught, you know, and it makes you steal and then you get caught, it'll lead you into financial ruin. He's not just talking about like, Financial ruin of coveting after, after a vehicle that leads you into indebtedness, although that is true. That happened to me. A good friend of mine bought a, bought a brand new pickup truck. Luann and I at the time, we had a perfectly good car. It was a, it was a uh, 1995 uh, Pontiac Firebird. We, beautiful red car, absolutely nothing wrong with it. And a friend of mine gets a brand new Ford pickup truck and he starts telling me about the new Ford Mustangs that are out on the line. And so they, they'd come out in the new body style. This is 1998, the 99 Mustangs had come out and like I had to have one of those Mustangs. And so me and my buddy, we go and we look at it. I come home, I tell Luann, hey, I think we need to buy a new Mustang. And she's like, wait a minute, like we've got a car. Why would we do that? And then again, my gift of of, of preaching can sometimes be, be used in a wrong fashion. My, my, my gift of argument, uh, being argumentative and breaking her down. And so, uh, and somehow, some way, I talked her into letting me buy, us buy, this 99 Mustang. And I remember pulling out of the car lot, Jack came forward, looking in the rearview mirror at my firebird and thinking i like that car better than i like this car right with a new six-year payment that's going along with this car versus very little payment left with that car back there and i thought what am i doing but yet my my pride wouldn't let me go back and say ho 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 i've made a mistake and so then i we kept the car and the next year later i changed jobs and Luann and I looked at it, and we were like, we can't afford this car. And so we went to a car lot. We traded in our 1999 Mustang and six years worth of payments for a 1995, it seems like, or something like that, Nissan Altima, and like a ton of indebtedness, being upside down on this car like crazy. And for the next seven years, we were paying off a Mustang that we weren't driving because we were driving an Altima. And it all goes back down to coveting, not being content with what you have, allowing all of that to fuel and to feed seven years of stupidity, financial stupidity. But listen, Paul's not just talking about that here in this text. 
the destruction that he's describing is even deeper than that, into ruin and destruction. He's talking about, again, he's talking about spiritual destruction. I, we know that because the context is he'll say in, um, down in the second part, he'll say that it, hold on to eternal life. He's, he's talking about eternal life versus eternal death. But the first 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So let me f- finish up in this text, but just how do we respond to our own coveting in this? How do we kill coveting in us? And listen, we, we don't kill desire. Like, the Bible's not saying it's wrong to desire. It's wrong to have longings. It just depends on what the object of our longings are. The Christianity is actually about passions and longings and appetites and desires. We're just to direct those to him and to his things. Still in 1 Timothy 6, but as for you, O man of God, in verse 11 now, but as for you, O man of God, Look, flee these things. So what's he talking about? He's talking about coveting that's found. He's talking about discontentment. He's talking about trying to find your, your satisfaction in things. Flee those things. But look, pursue. So you're running from those things, but you're running to righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The coveting is about love and desire, and Christianity is about love and desire. It's just the question is the objects of our love and desire, and what Christianity is about is running from those objects that will lead us to lawlessness, lead us to brokenness, that will never satisfy us, that will never make us content, and running to Jesus, who in Jesus is fullness of contentment in him. That as I said earlier, that what coveting is, is whenever we have an increased desire for something other than what God has given us, and it's also a diminished desire for God. That the key to fighting and killing a coveting is just the opposite. It's to have an increased desire for God an increased desire for the things of God, an increased desire in understanding and reveling in the fact that God loves you and all that he's given you. And in that, it's also to put to death those worldly, fleshly desires in, in ourselves. That, are other, that it's to kill those desires that are in us by focusing in on our desire for the Lord. Isaiah 55, the prophet Isaiah writes, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. For why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me. And eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. 